and we're live okay. hello hello <laughs> good morning everyone good morning <laughs> how's it doing in chat oh yeah we've got a lot of folks in chat uh before we do that i just want to announce our episode so welcome this episode is called uh, Let's Encrypt SSL and a Guest Navigator, Caleb. And it's September 23rd, 2021. And uh, we're happy to be here. Chris and Mason are uh, taking the week off. So it's Matt and myself and Caleb. So welcome, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Good to have Caleb here. Uh, I think it would be very interesting with just two of us. Uh, so it's nice to have an extra face here. Uh, to, uh, bring some spice to the show. <laughs> Is that a ginger joke? It wasn't, <laughs> but if you want it to be, it can be. I'll go with it. <laughs> Who have we got in chat then? Let's see. Uh, if you're in chat, say hello. Uh, let us know where you're coming from. Um, we're always curious to see how uh, global the reach is of this mm -hmm. live stream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, while you're putting uh, your name and where you're from, uh, our hello world question to get you thinking about it is uh what's one of your favorite books of all time so you can ruminate on that and we can start saying hello so hello matt nice to have you here <laughs> so matt is actually a good friend of mine joining the stream. Oh. yeah and he lives about a mile from my house so oh, hello, that's matt. nice yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice got, friendly faces here. Yep, yeah, we've got, got Derry. Uh, we've got, let's see, Sendika from Jakarta, Indonesia. Excellent. We've got Andrew from sunny Florida. Ooh. Some people I haven't seen before. Welcome. Tracy from Arizona in the U.S. And Atakur from Bangladesh. I like the angle brackets and the <laughs> forward slash there. So, um yeah, keep uh, keep that info coming. Uh, who are you? Where are you from? Uh, maybe what brought you we here today? We should probably introduce ourselves as well, right? Oh yeah, if, I if, like if that we can idea. chat, tell us where we're where they're from. <laughs> Matt, will you lead us? <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm an engineer at Dio, uh, and I'm from London in the UK. Excellent. Uh, I'll go next. I'm Kim. I am a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. I focus on cloud native technologies and I live in Denver, Colorado in the US. And I'm Caleb, I'm an engineer at Splunk based in Dallas, Texas, uh, primarily focusing on building out Splunk Cloud. Awesome, great. There we go. <laughs> Looks like we've got a couple more in chat now. Uh, Tamida saying hi, uh, and then uh, can Seco David from Spain uh, on our what I'm going to say is our favorite platform Twitch. <laughs> yes, going to introduce the bias there because I've got to got to promote the Twitch channel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian from uh, Delhi, India, saying hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, and Tech from Bhutan. Welcome back, Tech. I've seen Tech a few times in the last couple of weeks. Shall we get into the actual question? I love it. I love the British spelling of favorite. So thank you, Matt. Um, oh, yeah, I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so what's one of your favorite books of all time? Uh, I can start. So one of my favorite books of all time is called The Dog Stars by Peter Heller. And it's a post-apocalyptic novel about uh, this time after a flu that kills a lot of the population. Um, but it's about this man who's a pilot and his dog and sort of how they navigate this world. And the one reason I like it is it's a great story, but the other reason I like it is that it all takes place in Colorado. So a lot of the places where he lives and where he goes exploring, I've been there. So it feels, it's really fun for me to read, to be like, oh, that's where I grew up or, oh, that's where I live now or, oh, I've been there. So <laughs> it just provides an uh, extra layer of richness when I'm imagining uh, what's going on in the book. So The Dog Stars by Peter Heller is my is one of my favorite books of all time. <laughs> I don't think I've ever read that, but I will put it on the list. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, shall I go next? Good. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, it Lining up with the uh, title of this segment of the stream, uh, my favorite book is Hello World, written by Hannah Fry. Oh. Um, I think I've mentioned it before on one of our shows. Um, it's a wonderful book talking about 
algorithms uh, and their application in the real world. Um, not only just how their how their applies in the real world, um, but like the good and the bad of it, and talking about perhaps where they don't fit in, like in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it goes into a lot of real world examples of where things have gone wrong with algorithms, where they've worked really well. Um, and all in all, it's just a really good book. And it, to me at least, when I read it a few years ago, um, I, I was obviously studying comps at the time, it really kind of showed me like the algorithms you're learning in isolation in CompSci do actually have applications in the real world. Mm. Um, and so it was kind of a nice tie back to the real world for me. Well, that sounds good. So it's called Hello World. What's the author's name again? Hannah Fry. Hannah Fry. Yeah. Tech, tech is not neutral <laughs> as yeah. much as we might want it to be. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Caleb, what about you? What's one of your favorite books of all time? <laughs> so I, I haven't read a book in probably 10 years, um, <laughs> I'll admit. But I, I'll I'll be the super basic person and say uh, probably Harry, uh, Harry Potter and the probably the first one, The Sorcerer's Stone, because that's what really got me hooked uh, on the series as a kid by J.K. Rowling, of course. Excellent. Yeah, we have, um, I know we have Tracy in the chat, who's another good friend of mine, um, huge, uh, huge Harry Potter fan. I'm sure she would agree with me. Outstanding. Yeah. Harry Potter. Uh, I listened to that, audio, the audiobook of the first one, uh, sort of toward the beginning of the pandemic. And I actually haven't read any, any Harry Potters and I've only seen the first movie. So that was fun to be like, ah, oh, this is what everyone's talking about. <laughs> That's incredible that you've only, you haven't seen them all. So, so Kim, you've got one up on me because I've never read any Harry Potter, never seen any oh. Harry Potter. Like I just haven't done it ever. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things um, where you can actually absorb a lot through the culture. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or like what's I, I was like, it was I needed to figure out what my Harry Potter house was. So I took <laughs> I found a meme that was like the golden girls and their Harry Potter houses. And I was like, well, I'm this golden girl. Therefore, I'm this like through the transitive property. I'm I'm this Harry Potter house. But uh, I I enjoyed I enjoyed Harry Potter, uh, the first one, uh, but I, I like that it's part of the culture. So, um, yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, Kim, we've got a very important question for you in chat here. <laughs> is that a cat in the background? That is a cat in the background. Uh, that's my cat, Bowie. Uh, I have two black cats, and sometimes they sleep uh, while I'm streaming. So I, I leave the cat tree back there just in case. Uh, but Caleb also has a cat we were talking about. Sometimes they're running around or, or making a lot of noise. And then and then we shut the door <laughs> and let them let them do that so uh, you can't see or hear them. <laughs> Well, it looks like we have a couple of responses in the chat, uh, which I'd love to call out. Um, so oh, let's see if I can get this name right. Uh, Cruz US TV says, The Road by Cormac McCarthy and The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. Um, I haven't read The Road, but I, I had to read The Things They Carried um, for my freshman year of college. Every single freshman who went to the college that I went to, we all read that. And then like the first week of college, Tim O'Brien came and spoke. And that's a very, it's a very, it's a good book. It's hard to read. It's about uh, Tim O'Brien's like experiences in as a soldier in Vietnam. So. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and then the great programmer says, Enid Blythen's Mystery of Holly Lane. Is that something either of you have heard of? I haven't. <laughs> I haven't. I don't, I don't think I've read that book, but Enid Blyton as an author generally um, has an amazing collection of like kids books and stuff. Um, oh, cool. Many of which I have read as a child. Excellent. I am Mystery so of out of the loop with any of these authors. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's Enid, all good. I feel like Enid Blyton's a very british author question mark or at least the books feel like they're very british mm. it sounds like it's part of like british yeah. school culture based on what you just said <laughs> so all right well uh if you think of a book that's one of your favorites and you still want to share in chat we can come back and look at it um but i think we're we're ready to move on to our next segment <laughs> 
And unfortunately, because Mason's not here, we have no <laughs> special sound effects this week. We're just going to have to put up with us going, it's the next section. <laughs> and now for the next section. <laughs> so let's jump into some news. Ex excellent. All right. I'm ready to go. <laughs> cool. Uh, first news item of the week. Uh, kind of, I don't know, sometimes we do releases at the start, and this falls into that. OpenSSL 3.0.0 has been released. Uh, major version update, um, actually jumping from 1.1.1, I think. Um, yes. <laughs> which is quite interesting. And there is somewhere in either this post or the OpenSSL post directly, they do talk about why they've jumped two major versions. Um, the TLDR being some other related tooling has a 2.0 version, mm. and they decided it was confusing. Yeah, I that's what know. I read as well. Um, uh, I think it's because the the OpenSSL FIPS module already had a version uh, 2.0, and they wanted to keep OpenSSL and OpenSSL like FIPS module at the same major versions for consistency's sake. So, oh, they, okay. just, so they just went from 1.1.1 to 3.0 just yeah. to keep it in line. Uh, uh, and the big change here is that OpenSSL has been relicensed as part of this major release. So uh, going forward, it's now licensed under Apache 2.0. Mm. rather than, I believe it was previously a GPL license. There were two weird licenses. It was like, well, there's the OpenSSL like, proprietary license, and then there's SSL EAY license. Like, I, I've never even heard hmm. of that until like I read this article. Ah, well, at least it's now a more far, far more standard Apache license. Yeah, I'm glad to see that. <laughs> so now everyone knows what they're doing with it. Uh, there you go. There's the uh, 3.0, so 2.0 link. Yeah, ah, excellent. Thank you. Um, the holy hand grenade of Antoc Antioch. <laughs> That's quite a title. <laughs> yeah. It's also quite an old blog post. Um, yeah, it shows how long it's been in the works, I guess. 2018. That is uh, a little while ago, especially in tech time. Um, all right. So, yeah, if you're curious about why the OpenSSL went from 111 to 3.0, uh, check out this blog post. Uh, and I like uh, I like this old school look of the of the page. <laughs> oh yeah, LWN has not changed in a long time. <laughs> Definitely like '90s hacker vibes for sure. Definitely <laughs> <laughs> like Times New Roman. I like it. <laughs> so there you go. There's the first news item. Um, now imagine a laser sound effects in your heads. <laughs> I will jump onto the next news item. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Click House. Um, and it also a bit of open source software uh, has an update in terms of how it's being developed. Uh, it's no longer part of Yandex. Um, Clickhouse Inc. has formed and spun off from Yandex. Uh, so Clickhouse is now developed by Clickhouse Inc. instead of Yandex. And they've got a dedicated team of developers working on it. Now, I don't know what Clickhouse is. So can one of you tell me more about it? <laughs> I, um, warehouse question mark. It's a like column-based database they use for like analytical type workloads. Uh, um, okay. So I don't know if that like attributes to like another time series database, but they like Clickhouse really focuses on um, scaling real time analytics. Uh, one of the coolest things that I read about Clickhouse was a uh, direct quote was one of the early adopters, uh, Cloudflare, uses Clickhouse to process a large portion of their HTTP traffic on the internet, which is ten plus million records per second. Holy, whoa. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah, the clear goal is scale there. Yeah. Okay. So, Excellent. yeah, in my, in my head, ClickHouse has always just been, like, performant data warehouse, essentially, for real-time stuff. Yeah, this, this sentence here, it says, the most notable advantage of ClickHouse is its extremely high query processing speed and data storage efficiency. What huh. an opening sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, web analytics and like handling um, a, just a, a lot of data, <laughs> sounds like. Yeah. And they do some cool comparisons for like folks who are familiar with other like data warehouse systems. Like they specifically call out Elastic and Hadoop, Spark, things like that. Nice. And uh, why did they uh, spin out from Yandex? Uh, I read into this. I, I, I wasn't really, I, at least I didn't get as like, specific reason other than just ClickHouse is such a big thing in its own right that they've just decided to spin it out into its own company so it's separate from Yandex. 
That's kind of what right. I got as well. Yeah, it wasn't very clearly defined, but that definitely seemed to be the reason. So it, maybe there's more to, more to the story internally, um, but there's, it's not like they've said somewhere, oh, there was a massive riot internally that they wanted to be separate. <laughs> um, sure, it seems we to had... just kind of naturally happened. <laughs> That that makes sense. Yeah, you can't uh, you can't put all the juicy details in a press release. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there you go. All right, click house. News item. <laughs> all right, next up. Next Pew! up, the internet's going to break. TM. Um, <laughs> uh, a week from today. I'm yeah, a week from today. To I might take PTO. <laughs> <laughs> I might just yeah, just gone gets, that day. PTO get some popcorn <laughs> and just what did that fall apart? Um, Let's Encrypt's root certificate is expiring in a week's time. Okay. Um, don't stress though, there is a newer root certificate that's all Let's Encrypt certs are now signed with. Um, so if you have a device that is kept up to date, you're going to be fine because your device has the new root certificate and trusts it. Um, the issue here is that the current root, the, the root certificate that's expiring. Um, is on a lot of older devices that aren't getting updated anymore. So mm. they don't have the new root certificate. Um, and so they might start to see the internet not work because the SSL certs will no longer be trusted. Um, I think Scott's very helpfully put a list of devices uh, in this blog post uh, uh, down at the bottom that. that has that kind of goes over what will be impacted by this. Um, the TLDR really being if you have an old device that's not getting updated. Uh, it might be affected. Um, so you go like Windows, anything less than XP Service Pack three ah, will get a break. So nice. you're probably fine if you're on Windows um, or Mac OS ten twelve, which is super old as well. Um, mm. So yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I suspect but, though that Android version will be a problem as because like with Android, there's a lot of manufacturers that just they push out a single image you know, at mm -hmm. release time and then they never push out any over the air updates and so, yeah. Yeah, that's, that'll be a problem. And so, then so I say, Android was called out, though, because although actually quite a recent version is going to stop working, uh, there is a secondary cross-signed root certificate in Let's Encrypt certs now, um, which essentially works on an Android bug to hmm. get the certificate to be trusted still when it shouldn't be, as far as I can tell, um, which covers a much wider range of Android devices, but is only valid for four more years. So in four years' time, we're going to have the same issue again. Um, but yeah, I don't know. TLDR, update your device if it stops working. Um, yep. I think the real chaos here is actually going to be like embedded systems and stuff. Yeah, that makes where sense. They've, <laughs> where they just inherently don't get updates. Um, but yeah, just a heads up, especially if you work in anything that has SSL certs, check that they're up to date. Yes. There's going to be that one EC2 instance stood up in like 2012 <laughs> by, by some guy who just forgot about it. And it runs like a quarter of the internet. Yep. Uh, yeah. And you're like, oh, no, that was Joel. And he he left five years ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, it's kind of um, it's. I, I don't think I've ever been in the position to be like, oh, the internet may break on this date. Usually it's like, oh, the internet broke today. Uh, let's let's see who who did it. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious. I'd say like normally we see like, say Cloudflare has an outage or uh, Fastly has an outage. And we go, oh, the internet broke for 10 minutes. But no, we know this time that something's going to break. Um, yeah. Just hopefully not much. All right. What is the date? I should put it on my calendar. September 30th. I'm, there's an exact time, um, but it's like in BST time, and I can't convert that on the fly. <laughs> I won't yeah, worry. So there, is, there is somewhere in here. There's, Scott has pulled out the timestamp from the certificate. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is a very good blog post. Uh, kudos to Scott. Scott this Helm. is what Scott does full time. He's a security advisor. Um, okay. Well, he seems like he's very good at his job. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Heads up. All right. Our next news item. Oh, this one's broken Kim's brain. <laughs> this one I'm finding hard to wrap my head around. <laughs> so it's uh, infrastructure as SQL, and the tagline is infrastructure state is data, infrastructure state is code, and early access it makes it seem like it's a product of some sort. Yeah, I couldn't really determine that. Like, what's the consumption slash deployment model of this? And I first saw this, and I saw like the syntax, and 
I definitely had a biased lens working at Splunk, which, you know, we do all this already. Yeah, so there's a, a blog post on infrastructure as SQL on Dev2, which is the one where I was kind of like half reading it while we were preparing this morning. And I was <laughs> like, I, I still I, I still don't get it. Um, so um, I don't know, Caleb. Yeah, what? Uh, okay, I like this comment. Can't tell if real or not, but sign me up. I appreciate yep. that, that attitude. I'm in that boat as well, I think. It's just, <laughs> most of me thinks this is just a, a big meme. <laughs> um, like just like a joke towards uh, all the uh, infrastructure's code stuff, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I could see the use case being like for like large scale deployments where you have a, like a million accounts or or droplets, whatever it may be, whatever pr provider you're using, where you need to find out like, do I have any infrastructure using an AMI older than three or four years or something like that. So like oh, yeah. may not have received updates. That, that could be like one of the useful scenarios, I think. Okay, that is helpful. Yeah, where you can just be like, I'm gonna search through the column with the date and and identify all those machines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, also, I really, I'm really curious, like if this is a real product, how does it work? Um, like in my head, maybe this, Maybe you like you write to the database, and then there's essentially like an export script that exports mm -hmm. to say Terraform, and then actually controls the infrastructure through Terraform. Still, I don't really know. Um, yeah, I did wince when I saw like the raw SQL query. I was like, oh, do I need to remember how to do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe this is all just like one giant plot for people to get or sign up for the early access and just collect email addresses. It could okay. just be an email grab. <laughs> Well, we'll keep. Oh, I'll keep an eye on this, and uh, maybe when <laughs> when something's released, uh, we can bring it back up in the yeah. in the news segment. <laughs> well, no, it's it, it's an interesting thing to read. Um, and it's I don't know. It's a new it's a new concept and a new take on infrastructure as code. So yeah, that's true. All right, pew. <laughs> so uh, this one's less less cloud uh, and more just general tech, uh, but iOS fifteen is now generally available. I haven't used iOS since iOS 7. Ooh. Oh, wow. <laughs> Shame, I shamelessly say it. <laughs> so what, what do you daily drive now then? Um, Android, mainly Pixels, just so I'm up to date on the latest uh, latest Android. I'm, I'm so heavily embedded into the Google ecosystem. It's, okay. It would be such a painful switch if oh, I did yeah. do it. Yeah. I say, yeah I, I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm like heavily embedded in the Apple ecosystem. I'm the same way. And uh, it's not even like a particular allegiance to Apple. It's just like, well, I've had Apple products for a while now. And <laughs> I actually, a friend of mine who was on the show a couple of months ago, Brooks Patton, he used to be all Apple and I watched him migrate over to Google. And it was interesting because he had like a migration plan. <laughs> like, okay, well first I'm going to like change from the Apple watch to uh, some other watch and then I'll gradually like <laughs> move over. So I I'm not that ambitious. <laughs> So while I'm not like an iOS user, like I did look through the change log and see like what new features there are. And one thing I thought was interesting was the new feature called SharePlay, where you can ah uh, yes, you can basically live stream while like seeing the other person. I thought this was like a unique take on virtual watch parties, given COVID times. Like as not awesome as it is, it's just a, it, like because of COVID, it, it is like a solution to still like stay connected. Yeah. I agree. I like that. I think Spotify has that feature as well, where you can like uh, get a group of people together and hit play and uh, listen. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, Discord also has a very similar feature uh, integrated with YouTube. You can do YouTube together, um, where you just all hop in a voice channel and then someone starts YouTube. You can all watch together there. I uh, I have a few memories where I would have uh, I would be on the phone like a not even a corded phone I guess like a wireless but non non cellular phone and I would I would a friend and I would be like okay let's watch this show on this channel together so we'd we'd be in our separate locations and we'd be watching the show at the same time and <laughs> reacting on the phone and honestly that's like a really fun way to connect um, so I appreciate uh, the the share play like I can. Uh, imagine you know watching uh, a, a television show with someone and so it's more fun to see their face uh and and chat with them to react see, see, the thing with yours, yours akin was like 
you're watching a live TV show, so you don't have to worry about content sync. They're yeah. Just, it's being broadcast. Um, <laughs> the thing that always gets me with these is like, how accurate is the timestamp syncing between the two devices? Like, say you're a second apart, your reactions to each other are going to be really off. Yes, sometimes that would happen in, in the stories I told. There is an asterisk here. I'm very curious. It says, SharePlay is an entirely new way to have experiences with friends and family, no matter the distance. Asterisk. <laughs> I'm wondering if that like is like exists with um, certain countries that block certain oh. kinds of traffic. Oh, it just says coming later this fall. Oh. Uh, that's not as exciting as I was hoping. Oh. It was like, yeah, not, <laughs> it was like just not including Mars or something like that. <laughs> yeah. All right, exactly. Elon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then I think we have one more uh one more news item. Yeah, I'll let you take this one, Kim, because sure. sure. So uh emails. yeah, I got some I was on vacation last week and I checked my personal email and got multiple emails being like, oh, there's a big Kubernetes CBE. Um, so this one was released and Looks like the issue is that uh, users might be able to create a container with a subpath volume mount to access files and directories outside of the volume, including the host file system. So that's pretty scary. Let's see. At my last job, we would rotate on like um, into a security position where you, if a CVV came out, you would like do the research and see how it it was mitigated. And then if it, we needed to push out upgrades to customers, we would do that. Um, so the affected versions looks like 122.0 to 122.1, some versions of 121 and 120, and then fixed versions 122.2, 121.5. Okay, great, great, great. I know I did a Kubernetes tech talk oh, yesterday, and DigitalOcean's pushed out um, an upgrade, so all of the clusters are running 122.3. So nice, good um, turnaround time for sure. Yeah, it was yeah. a good turnaround time. Uh, Caleb, do you work with Kubernetes in your role? Um, not currently. I used to work with Kubernetes quite a lot, and I um, so I read uh, I read through the CVE and like I I couldn't decipher like how this the the symlink exchange came into play. Like there's I understand like by using the subpath, it's like you're using like volume mounts, but I'm not sure how the symlinks tie into it. You know, I know a guy who like fixed everything with symlinks, but I didn't... I, I would assume that the symlink is what lets you jump outside mm. of the container back into the host file system. Right. I, I was just hoping somewhere for... there's a symlink resolver that's not sandboxed correctly. I was hoping for more like details around how it actually like um, followed that path. Yeah, I didn't didn't read through that. Oh, this just took me, I think, to the same. Uh, yeah, I think that was a self link. Same page, <laughs> 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 which is <laughs> oh well, yep. Um, yeah. It okay. Is. So this maybe this got filed somewhere other than GitHub initially. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, if you're running Kubernetes, I would uh, definitely check check the version that you're running, and if it's uh, in one of these affected version ranges, um, like do the upgrade. It's absolutely. Say, it seems like worth between it. <laughs> between those versions that are listed there, it's pretty much every version prior to the fixed versions. Because yeah, because it's all like the it. dot zero releases, and then everything from one dot nineteen. Good. Good observation yeah Ugh. so um yeah yeah like i said i got some emails about it in my personal email account which was like okay <laughs> <laughs> all know. right uh, but my, my take here is just like sim links causing security issues consider me so <laughs> shocked <laughs> they enough. seem to be always the cause of anything like this <laughs> it's got to be um, fun to be a security researcher where you're like, okay, now I'm going to try this thing like, <laughs> and see if this works. Like, that part's probably fun, but then the <laughs> aftermath is just the anxiety is just probably just too much. That yeah. probably is stressful to be like, oh, no, that worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw on Ian Coldwater's Twitter that they um, they were talking about how they were part of the team that, that discovered this uh, vulnerability. Um, so if you're curious... Uh, Looks like uh, these people uh, under the acknowledgement section, their their Twitter accounts might might give us some good details. Mm. So, yeah, there you go. All right, update your stuff. Update your stuff. I thought it's just yeah. like evergreen advice <laughs> and tech. Just stay updated, please. Yeah, I uh, I was preparing a 
tech talk or a, a lightning talk for uh, a conference and it was about SSH and uh, realized, oh, like SSH clients sort of get installed on machines or operating systems uh, when you get them. And it's easy to forget to update stuff like that, that you didn't install yourself. So uh, you it's, it's good advice. Yeah, you can up update your SSH client. Um, I just never thought about that. I have um, <laughs> apt upgrades on for a weekly cron jobs on most of my stuff, but probably That's not a great idea, but it might break things, but at least I'm less susceptible to security. You know? Yeah. Yeah. At least you're, even if it's a tool, just get you thinking about like, oh, wait a minute. Like, does that need to be updated or did I read something about that? So, um, yeah. Well, that was news flash. Um, we've got some, uh, some engagement in the chat. So Yogins, welcome. Uh, and Yogins was just saying ClickHouse is used for web analytics. So that's kind of what we what we figured out. Uh, Teo, welcome. It's nice to have you. Uh, and then uh, I've got Rodrigo saying hello and Toon Army Captain saying infrastructure as Spotify playlist. So oh, that, that's an interesting concept. I'd love to wait, <laughs> listen to infrastructure. Well, I'm, I'm assuming that's a reference to the recent um, like news about the Terraform Spotify um, provider where like HashiCorp did this thing or make a playlist using Terraform and it's, oh! like, a con it's like a contest. So I'm assuming that's what that's referencing. Okay, I'm gonna have to look that up. That sounds like fun. Um, so. Yeah. I've well, touched the Spotify you. API once and it's awful. So <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a bit nice behind Terraform. And you still it still requires like an OAuth middleman and it's it's still not awesome to use. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's like they, they don't actually like you using the API. <laughs> you can't challenging. just generate a token. All right, well, let's go on to our next uh, segment, which I'm really excited about. And I bet some people watching are, are curious about. Uh, so uh, next up is our, our, our uh, brief interview of our guests. So um, we're really lucky to have Caleb joining us. Um, Caleb, we're going to ask you some questions. Um, but uh, first question is just tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, where do you work? And what do you do now in the tech industry? <laughs> Sure. Um, my name is Caleb. Uh, as mentioned, I am a software engineer at Splunk, uh, primarily working on Splunk Cloud. I live in I live in Dallas, Texas. Um, I have a munchkin cat named Max, who is only a quarter inch shorter than the world's tallest cat, or the world's shortest cat. Ooh, <laughs> he's, a, he's a quarter inch taller. That's what it was. Yeah, that's so. not very many. Uh, that's not very much. <laughs> no, I wanted him to hold the record so that way I could get like free like cat food sponsors and stuff. I wouldn't have to pay for that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I also, so outside of work, I, I have a decent reputation of building dumb things and putting it on the internet, which is actually kind of how I got here today. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I, I got invited to like join the first class of DigitalOcean Navigators by uh, creating the McBroken dashboard during the <laughs> app platform hackathon. So like, I'm sure most folks uh, who are like within the tech community here remember uh, mcbroken.com, which is just a site that tells you what McDonald's ice cream machines are broken, like how many and where. Um, and that was a that was the result of like a reverse engineered hack by a, a GitHub engineer in Germany, where he he would just use the reverse engineer the McDonald's app, tries to add an ice cream uh, to the cart mm. from, from every McDonald's store in the U S and if it oh wasn't, able to, if you couldn't add it, then it was deemed broken. And so I just like scraped all of his data, turned it out to a custom Prometheus exporter, uh, and then threw it out on Grafana, deployed it to the app platform. And it was great. And then left the flexibility to integrate with like alert manager. So, Hey, look at that. You know, the 50% of all ice cream machines are broken in the country. <laughs> like, why not? So, I'd yeah. like to think that McDonald's HQ started using that. So they knew just the scale of the issue. Well, I think that actually invoked um, the recent like uh, like federal investigation into <laughs> the, all the. I broken saw that machines. like the FTC, the uh, Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. is like, we need to look into this. <laughs> yeah, global pandemic, but we need to look at these ice cream machines. <laughs> that's things. good. That's very cool. Um, that's and it's also it's i'm li i'm like giggling at the way the data was acquired i was like oh, yeah. does mcdonald's have a public api it's like oh no <laughs> yeah, i don't know how exactly it was done through the app but regardless like that methodology is genius oh yeah that's so clever um question for those who don't know what is splunk 
Splunk is, I, I think the formal term is the data to everything platform. So it's mainly used for everything data. So monitoring, uh, alerting, just data analytics, aggregation, you ship all of your, your logs or just any kind of events into this one platform. And it gives you the ultimate flexibility to give you insights into your data and then add whatever kind of hooks you would like into that data. You can develop and install custom apps. So like if there may be a digital ocean app that creates all these indexes for you and automatically knows to scrape all these fields from your data, things like that. Oh. Yeah, I think and it's well known within the tech community for sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, what, uh, like what part of Splunk do you get to work on as a software engineer there? Yeah, so I'm on the, uh, I'm on the cloud automation team. So I write lots of Terraform and I do uh, lots of Go as well for uh, like uh, the automation integration points. So just making sure that things work all the time okay. as, all, as, as all things cloud. So yeah. Sweet. Very cool. I, I like that line. Like I'd have that as a job title, just maker of things that work. <laughs> uh, Matt, why don't you uh, ask Caleb some questions? What are you curious sure. about? Sure. Uh, so we, we, we touched on your current role and what we're doing now, um, but kind of give us some history. Like what have you done previously? How did you get into tech and kind of what was that journey like? Sure. Um, I'll try and be brief because it's it's not a question that like I get a lot, but it's I find it interesting at least because it's yeah. Well, I, I I got into tech like when I was like really young because I saw the movie Hackers when I was like ten. <laughs> yes. And then I, I thought it was great. Like to me, they were the ultimate like superheroes of their own domain, just conquering this virtual world. <laughs> and and I like I thought it was great. And then so I got my first laptop. I was like twelve, and then it was like cheap laptop. So it was like super slow. And I started Googling how to make it faster and then started learning everything about how computers worked and then got my first job in the IT space when I was like 16, like when I was old enough to work Ooh. just <laughs> for a local ISP, like just doing cable installs Then got into like help desk stuff at my high school, did the same thing in college to where I got an internship at my first like large corporate, uh, corporate gig, uh, doing like data center server hardware automation things. So I did that for a bit and then joined uh, that company for like four years, did a lot of, a lot of cloud automation as that for my primary role. And then I, just a year ago, actually, I moved to Splunk. Um, it'll be a year like next week, actually. Ooh, and congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Um, and there I've just been doing more cloud automation. So I think that's, that's like the brief overview and how I became like cloud automation guy um, and why I'm in cloud and cloud chats today. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, that's what uh, that looked like. If someone is um, wants to like learn more about how to like write automation scripts or sort of get into that slice of of the tech industry, what would you recommend? Hmm, that's a good question. Like it it all depends on like what you're trying to do. Like the the best the best advice like I I think that I give to most people is like have a have a legitimate problem that you want to solve. And let's mm -hmm. say you want to use cloud to solve that problem. Um, then just start Googling all the things, uh, so to speak. Like, I think there, there's good ways to get, to like break the barrier to entry to cloud, to like follow like um, certain streams of news and articles and things like dev.2 is a great resource. If you subscribe to like the cloud hashtag, you can mm. see, tr you can see trends of like what's going on with cloud and how it may relate to what you're trying to solve or learn. And it's just, uh, there needs to be like a lot of self-motivation there um, and just start reading into those sources. Uh, the thing that really struck me in what you just said was uh, find like an actual problem that you want to solve. Um, so do you, I have some personal examples. Do you have any good examples? <laughs> um, let me see. Um, well, I can, about cloud specifically? About just any like, so I find that, um, when you're learning like web development, um, I think there's a clear path to like, well, I'm just going to build a little web page, and sure. like maybe it's relevant to me, maybe it's not. Um, but I find that it's harder when you're trying to get into cloud stuff or DevOps or automation to find learning exercises. Well, um, so like recently, I actually did that to follow that same process recently. This actually that project right behind me there, and uh, it was featured on like several news sources um, last week called a pumpkin pie, but with no E. Um, I always wanted to build something using like 
hardware type devices like servo motors, motion sensors. Oh, cool. And so I, I wanted to build a cool Halloween prop um, where like I could have some creepy device move mechanically like and programmatically. So I started looking into how do servos work? How do you control them through like PWM out outputs and same thing with inputs from motion sensors. So I just started watching a lot of YouTube videos, started Googling, seeing like looking at other uh, projects and similar projects that people have done and just went from that. Like I had no idea what I was doing just three weeks ago. Now it works. So what, what you do is you just walk to both sides of the prop. There's motion sensors, detects which side you're on, angles the servo accordingly. So it looks like the pumpkin's watching you. That is so cool. Is the code for that uh, in your GitHub account? Oh yeah, I was I was sure to um, thoroughly document it, like the wiring diagrams, the like the hardware build, all the materials needed. It's um it's actually it's under my GitHub handle right there um, on the stream. So yeah, if you're interested in building one of your own, just go look at the pumpkin pie repo under my namespace, and it's all there. That's so cool. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> And then I think like our uh, last question, unless people who are watching have questions, please throw them in chat. Uh, what is a digital ocean navigator? <laughs> hmm. Let's see. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the best way to like answer that. Um, so the, I, I see a digital ocean navigator is like a, the ultimate like community ambassador for what awesome things you can do and build and like how you can help the community with using digital ocean in general. Um, some like questions I guess like, well, what do you do as a digital ocean navigator? It's nothing like super formal, but what I, what I do is I try and help the community to do like, a, like solve their problems using digital ocean in the cloud. So like, I can give you an example. Um, not long ago, it's like Hacktoberfest related to not long ago. I had a conversation with my director who said like, how do we track um, you know, our Hacktoberfest contributions from, you know, our company, like in general, it's a real hard thing to do and it's fairly manual today. Like how do we keep records of that? And so I came up with this idea of like the GitHub pull request exporter also under my GitHub there, where we can just provide a list of like employees who opt in via config file. It'll go and scrape pull request data specifically for those users. And we can just throw it out onto a dashboard via Prometheus and Grafana and we can track okay, like what did we actually do for Hacktoberfest um, go for the past 30 days? And so it allows us to automatically maintain that list. So I thought that was like a good method to solve our problem and those of the community for who are like trying to solve Hacktoberfest events and monitor, I don't know how, like all the contributions that came from such event and like, how do you measure your results? Um, I love I, that. Yeah, it's, I thought that was like a good way for not only to solve my problem, but everyone else's problem um, pertaining to Hacktoberfest and beyond. I really, really dig that because like working on Hacktoberfest itself, we intentionally don't make the data pri uh, public anywhere. Um, mm. Mostly because we're not allowed to. Um, it's really cool to see people like yourself building systems to track what is, although we can't share the data, the data is entirely public because we're all, it, the whole thing is building on open source. Um, it's really cool to see that data get aggregated. Absolutely, yeah, it's it's something that, I mean, the APIs are available, the data's there, you just, you have to just go get it. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I just wanna uh, call out uh, your friend Matt, called you the goat, the greatest of all time. <laughs> that's uh, very complimentary, but yeah, it sounds like you do some really <laughs> cool and interesting projects and a lot of them are related to automation. So yeah, uh, if you're curious about those things, check out Caleb's uh, GitHub account and maybe you can learn more. Yeah, I think we're right. that. Yeah, I was just gonna, to I was gonna ask. Yeah, let's do it. I, I accidentally shared my screen, but I can reshare it now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, next up is our true or false game. I am extremely excited for this topic, and I appreciate Mason because. It took me like two hours to put this thing together. <laughs> so it's a lot harder than it looks. So um, I'm not going to reveal the topic quite yet. We'd love for everyone watching to join us. Uh, go to kahoot.it and then type in the pin 633-5371. Uh, uh, and oh, we've got Amiable Finch. Got people joining. 
dynamic bobcat. You'll get a uh, randomly generated name. And if you win, you'll email me and we'll send you some digital ocean swag. So yeah, uh, yeah please join us. Uh, we're going to give a little time for people to join. And while we do that, we've got our word of the week, um, which I'm excited to go over. So our Word of the week is SSL, <laughs> which was our first news item, Open SSL. So uh, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, and it's a secure protocol developed for sending information securely over the internet. Uh, most websites use SSL for secure areas of their sites, like user account pages and online checkout. And uh, when you're asked to log in or you, you connect with the website, uh, the resulting page is generally encrypted with SSL. So um, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Caleb and Matt, tell, tell me what you know about SSL or something that definition missed. It still drives me nuts that like we don't just use TLS instead. Like, <laughs> so like, yeah. so you know, there's SSL v2 and v3, which like nobody really uses anymore. And there's TLS like 1.1, 1.2, like et cetera. But TLS is like what everyone uses today. But yet whenever we refer, re refer to like HTTPS, like we always say SSL, not TLS. I, I wish we could break that convention, but I think it's here to stay. Yeah, I say like the technology is actually TLS, but right. everyone calls it SSL. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's going to stay like that. Unfortunately, HTTP T would be strange. <laughs> H okay, that's true. It, you'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, if you've just joined us, we have not started our game of uh, true or false yet, but you can join us by going to kahoot.it and uh, entering the pin six three three five three seven one. And before we get started. One yes. other reminder, when you're playing along, um, it's not just, it's going to be a true or false quiz. Um, so binary options, true or false for each question. Um, but it's not just about getting it right. Uh, Kahoot rewards you for being fast. Um, <laughs> and that is generally how the game ends up being won. Um, people generally tie on scores and then or tie on number of questions they got right. And then how fast they were answering the questions gives them a higher score. And that's how you win. Um, so don't sit there for ages thinking about your answer. Uh, it's probably far better to kind of go with the gut instinct and just press the button as quickly as you can. Um, and it also combats the whole idea of Googling. Cheat. Don't Google the answers because uh, <laughs> you'll be too slow. All right. We've got 13 participants. That's a nice number. Let's go ahead and get started. So this is our Kahoot true or false quiz this week. It is the Nintendo edition. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. True or false? Nintendo was founded as Nintendo Karuta in 1889 to produce Hanafuda or flower cards. True or false? I think we are already have 11 answers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 1889 feels like it's either like, I don't know. I don't want to comment. <laughs> <laughs> So that answer is true. Uh, so Nintendo was uh, founded originally in 1889 to produce uh, a type of Japanese playing card. The original headquarters were in Kyoto, Japan. Um, and eventually they branched out into producing uh, playing cards for the United States and then got into different types of games, uh, including like video games. So let's see. It's amazing how long they've been around for. I oh my gosh, I know. All right, we've got Am Amiable Finch and Friendly Lizard tied for first. The Nimble Boa, Purple Lizard, and Dynamic Bobcat not far behind. Let's go on to the next question. So true or false, in 1973, Nintendo developed a laser duck hunting game. True or false? Yep, Toon Army, Toon Army Captain says, I do not know the year. I, I did a, I pulled a couple Mason things here where it was like, is that the right year? <laughs> 1889 is still blowing my mind. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, I, I did not know the history of Nintendo, so I enjoyed learning about it. So true or false, in 1973, Nintendo developed a laser duck hunting game. It is false. Uh, what is true is the year 1973. Um, 
but what they, uh, they, uh, you know, I'm realizing this is maybe the same thing, but they developed a laser clay shooting system, uh, in Japan, and it actually rivaled bowling, which was very popular in Japan for uh, like popularity in the country. So well, I'd that, call that different. Dot com is oh. a very specific game. <laughs> That's true. Just thinking, oh, the clay. When you do, when you you like. Uh, send the clay, the clay pigeons, that's what they're called in the air, and shoot them. Maybe that's simulating ducks, but I don't really know. All right, let's see the leaderboard. We've got Amiable Finch in first place, Friendly Lizard in second place, not far behind, Dynamic Bobcat in third, and then Purple Lizard and Clever Piranha. And if you just joined us, you can join still, uh, kahoot.it, and then the pin 633 yeah, All right. I'll say you can join at any point in the game, and um, because it's so based on how fast you answer, you can still win even if you join like halfway through. If you're fast. All right. Next question: True <coughs> or false? In 1980, Nintendo entered the Japanese arcade video game market with Radar Scope. True or false? The first like big console game in Japan that Nintendo released was called Radar Scope. Ooh. All right. The answer was true. Lots of people got that right. So this is from Nintendo's Wikipedia page. Uh, Radar, Radar Scope rivaled Galaxian in Japanese arcades, but it failed to find an audience overseas and created a financial crisis for the company. Um, to try to find a more successful game, they uh, installed a new CEO, and that re that led to the release of Donkey Kong, the console game in 1981, uh, one of the first platform video games that allowed the player character to jump. So um, Radar Scope was sort of the precursor to Donkey Kong, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see. Matt and Caleb, do you, are you Nintendo console owners or have you been in the past <laughs> i am not uh, well, i think i was with like nintendo 64 when i was a kid which is still like some of the best memories ever but today i learned that i know nothing of nintendo <laughs> <laughs> that's all right <laughs> i had uh when i was a kid i had the nintendo nes like the original console system you could have at home and then uh, i bought a nintendo switch last year so i guess i'm a nintendo nintendo person uh matt what about you <laughs> I don't know, really. I feel like I'm always too young. Uh, it's weird to say, but like Nintendo's heyday feels like it's before my time. Um, I've so. definitely had some Nintendo consoles growing up. I had a Nintendo DS for a long time. Um, played a lot of Nintendogs on that, uh, which is a wonderful game. Uh, and we also have a Wii downstairs that still works and Ooh. does still get used because I love playing OG Mario Kart on it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Looking at the leaderboard, okay, Amiable Finch, they know their Nintendo history is in first place, Friendly Lizard in second, and uh, Clever Piranha in third. Uh, and it looks like uh, up three places, Noble Wombat is the highest climber. So you've got a chance, Noble Wombat. All right, number four, true or false? In 1980, the first handheld video game system, the Game & Watch, was released and it was built from tech used in time-sharing systems, like mainframe time-sharing systems. So true or false, Game & Watch was released in 1980, and it was built from tech used in time-sharing systems. Gosh, we're so fast. Everybody's already answered, so... The answer to this is actually false. So it's true that in 1980, the Game & Watch, that handheld system, was released. But what's false is that... Uh, the it was based on technology let's see uh used on portable calculators uh not from a time sharing system so that one's a that one's a gotcha <laughs> that's you, you've really embraced how mason writes these questions it's <laughs> annoying me, yeah, that I'm, me I'm, mason said, I'm sorry <laughs> what mason said was it like last week you can run python on like a ti calculator now you can oh. yeah, yeah the newest ti84s can run full python on them which is just ridiculous Awesome. Why not? Why not program uh, with your thumbs? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was a gotcha. Friendly Lizard is in first place. Clever Piranha and Amiable Finch. Go on to the next question. True or false? Mario was originally named Jumpman. 
Oh, yeah, here's a better question. This is this is easy. <laughs> True or false, Mario was originally named Jumpman. Getting there. We've got 14 answers. Ooh, someone new joined. Yay. Yes, that is true. So from Nintendo's history page on their website, the hero originally called Jumpman is a carpenter racing to save his girlfriend, Pauline, from a crazed ape. Jumpman was later renamed during the establishment of Nintendo of America's headquarters by Nintendo Company LTD in honor of Jumpman's resemblance to their office landlord, Mario Sagali. He was later renamed Mario. <laughs> So can you imagine, can you imagine? the entire thing could just be called jump man? I, I don't think it would have made the change. It wouldn't have taken off jump man. <laughs> I, I can't even think of all the games. Like, <laughs> well, all right. Like Mario that... galaxy, for example, just jump yeah, man yeah. galaxy or like jump man carts. It just doesn't no. uh, roll off the tongue in the same way. We've got friendly <laughs> lizard in first clever piranha in second amiable finch in third nimble boa and purple lizard coming up. Next question, true or false, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, was released in North America in 1990. That is the video gaming system I had when I was a kid. Wow. They actually make those uh, like miniature cases like exactly uh, to this design for like Raspberry Pis now that people run emulators oh, on. Oh, that's right. What is it, the Pi, Vintage Pi, where you can play a lot of different video There's games? There's a number of them. That's one of them, I believe. Cool. So this is false. Uh, the year the NES was released was in, uh, I believe, 1985. Um, so, boy, I pasted way too much info <laughs> in my <laughs> notes. <laughs> uh, but we're going to go with 1985. Uh, it was when the NES was first released. Um, I uh, remember we had this in my family. We had an NES and I have some memories of my dad being like, Tetris is educational. And uh, I remember once being a kid and waking up like maybe early in the morning at like two or three and coming out into the living room and my dad was playing, uh, you know, Super Mario Brothers. And like, it's like, what are you doing, dad? He was like, oh, you know, playing video <laughs> games. So I have some good memories of the NES. Uh, all right. Wow, our leaderboard stayed exactly the same. Oh, wow. So go. let's go on to number seven. True or false, the original 1989 Game Boy was bundled with the popular third-party game Tetris. True or false, did the original Game Boy come bundled with Tetris? I feel like Tetris, much like the whole Mario series, is just one of those timeless games that's never going to go away. I agree. I agree. Oh, wow. Almost everybody got this. This is true. Um, so Nintendo released the Game Boy in 1989. In North America, the Game Boy was bundled with the popular third-party game Tetris after a difficult negotiation pro process with uh, Electro Organ Technica. <laughs> um, I heard a podcast once about the game developer who made Tetris, and I think he – it was uh, – Bef it was he was living in a, a Soviet bloc country and was like working for the government. Um, oh, wow. and so he actually has not been able to get any money from the game uh, because it was like a, a property of the government and not something he or a company was working on. That's awful. Yep. <laughs> I think that what is it? I think EA owns the rights to it now. Um, and I'm pretty certain they defend it really quite heavily. Oh, I'm sure they do. So, oh my gosh, friendly lizard, you have a a. A flame oh, icon seven. by your name. <laughs> Wait, hell, we're on question seven. They've yep. got every single question correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question eight. True or false? The Wii was released in November of 2006 with a total of five launch titles. So this is a uh, this is poor question writing because there's two facts here, but uh, was the Wii released in 2005 and was it released with five launch titles? True or false? I'm trying to I think love what the five would have been. Ooh, we're split down the middle. That is false. The Wii was released in November of 2006, but it launched with 33 titles. Uh, and I don't have any of the info on what those are. So, Matt, you have a Wii downstairs and you play what game on it? Uh, Mario Kart also like have uh, the Wii's own like 
and we sports uh, nice. and we sports resort which is the better version of we sports because <laughs> you can go and do the racing and the flying and the sword fight it's honestly timeless console <laughs> I think the Wii like controllers were the first things I exp where I experienced that haptic feedback. That, mm -hmm. that was like mind boggling to me. I think um, <laughs> possibly also like the first mainstream controller that was that could do all the gyro stuff and everything. I think I think that's right based on what I was reading. Um, it was really really innovative uh, yeah. at the time and probably still is. <laughs> Toon Army Captain says they dropped tennis in Resort. Yeah, I know a lot of people like yeah. Wii tennis. <laughs> So that's in the original Wii Sports. But, you know, just have both discs. <laughs> Get all the exercise. Friendly Lizard says they honestly don't know the answers, just guessing. <laughs> oh, Yogan, you're on, you're on fire. That is uh, a valid strategy here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to call out Happy Rhino, who's hopped up four places since the last question. Nice oh, work. Wow. All right, two more questions left. True or false? As of March 2020, more than five or 55 million switches have been sold. True or false? 55 million switches have been sold as of March 2020. Who knows? I uh, I would. <laughs> who knows as of myself. now, September yeah. 2021? Given that date, I'm inclined to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, and given that date, the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, yeah. Um, has, I, I, has... bought, I bought my Switch during the pandemic and I had to by like a an Animal Crossing edition because <laughs> it was the only one available. Yeah. I wonder if the Switch is um, cross the market to be the highest selling console of all time. Wouldn't That's surprise me if it hits that. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised either. It's a it's a cool device. Uh, the NES was the last console I had, so uh, it's been fun to <laughs> <laughs> fun to have another one. All right, we've got Ooh. Friendly Lizard in first, Clever Piranha in second, and Amiable Finch. In third place, last question, true or false, as of 2018, Nintendo is co-producing an animated Super Mario film alongside Illumination. True or false, Nintendo is co-producing an animated Super Mario film. Can you imagine if it was Super Super Jumpman? <laughs> if this is true, I'm excited because I did not know about this. <laughs> that image looks like... As SNL skit. It's definitely a Saturday. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the answer to that is true. Uh, according to Wikipedia, with some good uh, links to like industry publications, uh, there's a, a Super Mario film uh, in production. And I don't know what Illumination is. Uh, do either of you? I mean, it's a company, but I don't know if it's they're a film. They're one of the, <laughs> well, they're one of the animation firms, um, yeah. like DreamWorks and stuff, I think. Excellent. All right. Ah, uh, here we go. The podium in third place. Seven out of ten. Outstanding. Amiable Finch. Great work. In second place. Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. Clever ten Piranha. Out. And in first place with ten out of ten. Friendly Lizard, which might right. Be if Friendly Yogan. Lizard is Yogan from chat, who said <laughs> ten out of ten just by guessing. Very good. I mean, so that's the beauty. Or false uh yoginth uh you can honestly if you want to send mason an email you can do that but you can send me an email um oh boy yeah it's uh k schlesinger at digitalocean.com uh <laughs> that in the chat i should get uh i should get kim at digitalocean.com you try see like it, kim, yeah <laughs> uh, if not so, mason is just mason at digitalocean.com um exactly. which is easy to remember um when you send the email please include like a full shipping address postcode and everything um and also if you can a screenshot of your screen showing that it was you that won just so mason knows you're not lying <laughs> well thanks thanks for playing everyone uh you feel very bad yoga you don't have to feel bad uh we have a tiered <laughs> a tiered system of swag now for people who are repeat winners so um uh email and chat please uh I'll, I'll put that in there right now um all right. Well, thanks for playing. We all learned something about Nintendo, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and all now right. for the final section of the show this week, we're doing a slightly shorter show this week because um, there's only two of us hosts here um, with Caleb. Uh, I think Chris and Mason will be back in the next few weeks. So we'll have more sections, more of a bigger show coming up in the next week or so. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Let's jump into what's on your mind. And 
because I'm talking, it's not going to mean me this week. <laughs> Kim, what's on your mind? Sure. So uh, it is officially fall in the Northern Hemisphere and some leaves are changing and the temperature is cooling down and the, the light is changing. And I try to use the seasonal changes and transitions, which I'm lucky enough to have to sort of just pause and reflect on what's happened the last few months and what I'm hoping for uh, the next months ahead. So I'm just sort of enjoying enjoying the change of seasons because it has been a very hot summer in Colorado and a really smoky summer. We haven't had any wildfires, big wildfires in Colorado, but we've been getting a, a lot of smoke from wildfires in California. And it's, it's really hard when it's really hot and really smoky and it's not actually healthy to go outside and walk around. So yeah, I'm enjoying the clear, crisp fall air. So that's what's on my mind. <laughs> Definitely my favorite season. It's just, I don't know. It makes me feel warm and cozy inside, knowing that mm -hmm. I'm inside in the warm and it's <laughs> cold outside. <laughs> uh, I guess I can go next. Um, I'm looking at my I look at the notes doc, thinking that I've written something to talk about, and I haven't. Um, <laughs> I guess what's on my mind because I've been working the last few days uh, is error tracking. Um, mm. I've just been integrating Sentry into one of our new services we've deployed, um, and it's just so like mentally reassuring to have proper error tracking built into a service mm -hmm. like it hasn't produced any errors since i added it but it's just so reassuring to know that if something breaks it's gonna tell me that it's broken and it's gonna tell me where it broke and why it broke and sent like especially sentry is really good at this they have like like it says this is in a node app um mm. it keeps a breadcrumb history of like all the web requests that happened both coming in and outgoing prior to the error happening. It's just, I don't know, it's really wonderful error tracking. Um, if you ever deploy anything, you should add it. <laughs> it is nice to be able to be like, uh, something seems to be wrong, I've been alerted, or I know something's wrong, let me go look around. So yeah, um, it seems to be Blunk's purview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will quickly, whilst we're here as well, uh, answer a question in chat. Nanderson asks, will this chat be recorded to watch later? Yes, the live stream will be recorded um, on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see this week's episode and all the previous week's episodes as well and future ones oh. as well. So on Twitch cool. now. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think it's on oh. Twitch as well. I think there'll be a Twitch VOD up as well for like seven days, but it's on YouTube permanently. Got it. I didn't realize yeah. Twitch was lim limited in, in how much how many days of videos they keep? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Caleb, what's on your mind? I have to agree with you. I'm so looking forward to fall and to, to escape the triple digits here in Texas. Um, oh, Texas is hot. <laughs> so, um, most, I guess the thing I've, that's most been on my mind is actually like Halloween coming up because I've been doing a lot of Halloween focused projects, like the pumpkin being one. And then I've actually been building like a pretty intricate system, um, like interactive for like ha interactive Halloween decorations for my uh, for my house for my neighborhood oh, to use. So, so cool! <laughs> I've been I've been building that since like June. <laughs> so uh, the idea is like I have a sign in my front yard with a web address, which I won't disclose because I don't want people like hammering that from uh, across the other side of the world. Um, <laughs> so, and I have like a tons of interconnected hue lights and like spotlights with a um, like a a Google Assistant speaker, so folks can walk up, walk up, go to the site, use the mobile app, change the lights, do some effects. Play oh some my gosh, that is so cool! <laughs> yeah, so I've been working on that. I'm really looking forward to that and the responses that I, that we get, and also like doing kind of some error tracking with that as well. I've integrated like Prometheus with it, so I can see which color is the most popular, what sound, like what time of day or night do people come by and use it, um, things like that. And yeah, and it's all open source, of course, under my GitHub handle there. Search, search A on GitHub. I'm gonna this check is, out your your GitHub after. So, so. This is such a weird like culture thing. Like in the UK, like big light shows for Halloween and stuff just aren't a thing. I don't know. Maybe it is just like a real US thing. Yeah, I like you. I, I see like a lot of US people do it for Christmas as well. I'm just like, doesn't happen in the UK. We're all just like in our houses. You should start the movement. Make it a thing. <laughs> I would like, love to. Uh, 
British, I'm not sure, sure what the word would be, but like low key, low keyness. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> Definitely I, I a very British that. Yeah. I was listening to a, a, a podcast about uh, the show Ted, Ted Lasso, and the it was an American host who was interviewing Brit British people about their uh, reactions to Ted, 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 which is the show about this, like, like very tree like still American coach who goes to Britain and I guess which is ball, but uh, this fish man, man was saying like, oh yeah, like Americans are so, are so um, effusive and over the top and complimentary. And I was like, I, was like, I do that all the time. I non you colleagues <laughs> and maybe they don't like that. That is just, uh, I thought they might, uh, but it's just, yeah, it feels natural, natural part U U S culture and it doesn't tra translate across uh, culture lines which something for, for me to think about out yeah so we should have like a really cool wild uh, halloween like those I, I do think that a, an american expert you should, should get behind <laughs> kim i will just say it does sound like your mic has done its thing again okay where, let me... it, where it just decides that it, it no longer wants to do a microphone thing <laughs> we, we like we heard you but it's doing the the weird repeaty thing again I have like three sets of wireless um, like earphones with mics, but they never work out. So I stick to my trusty one wired with the little mic on it, and it <laughs> and it works flawlessly. Yeah, no. It, uh, sound is like the one thing that computers just have not ever figured out quite right. <laughs> like I, I'll join a Teams call for uni or something, and Teams just seems to never quite figure out what audio device I want connected. Is that you said uh, Teams was the, the service? Yeah, okay. yes. Teams is like, for me, that's all I've always noticed gets it wrong. But I think generally it's like computers aren't great at sound stuff for some reason still. They'll probably fix it in two weeks. I hear that's their turnaround time for Teams, <laughs> for teams updates. It's pretty good, actually. It's pretty fast. Kim, are all you right, back now? I'm back, but I'm cool. going to hand it over to Matt to do our next segment. <laughs> sure. Uh, so... Wrapping up what's on your mind, wrapping up the show generally. Uh, let's quickly jump into upcoming events uh, before we sign off and say goodbye. So what's coming up? Let's have a look at the look at the notes here. Hacktoberfest. Uh, how could I forget? Uh, obviously, Hacktoberfest is coming up in October. Um, everything starts kind of October 1st, you know, when we start tracking pull requests and stuff. Um, registration will open up on the site a couple of days before that. Um, but obviously, the site's up now with a load of information. Um, so if you think about planning like a virtual event for your local community or your online hack group, um, all the information is on the site for organizing that. Um, and you, you can even share it uh, on the site and we'll publish it and let people join. Um, you can join our Discord as well. Um, there's something like 20,000 people in there all chatting away and discussing what they're working on for Hacktoberfest, finding some issues, sharing projects, all that kind of cool stuff. So that's coming up. And I think next week, I th mm -hmm. think we're doing a special show where we have some of the team from Hacktoberfest coming on to talk about it. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> uh, so that's Hacktoberfest. What else we got? We've got live streaming on Twitch. Um, we're on Twitch currently. Hi, Twitch chat. Um, we've also got a load of other live streams happening on Twitch. Uh, so we have Sahar, who's live streaming on Mondays. Uh, Kim live streams on Tuesdays. And Chris is live streaming. Of course, Chris has to be complicated every other Wednesday. <laughs> uh, so you can catch us on Twitch. Um, uh, press the follow button if you haven't, and you'll get notifications when we go live. Absolutely. Uh, and then Tech Talks, final bit. Looks like there's two Kubernetes Tech Talks coming up. Three. Three, I, can't count. I think. Yeah. Kim, do you want to talk about those? <laughs> Sure, I'm not doing any of them, which is great. Oh, wow. Because uh, <laughs> I did one this week. But um, yeah, we have three great Kubernetes tech talks next week. The first one is on September 27th. It's Sarb Gupta, Introduction to Kubernetes Patterns. So, scaling your app with repeatable architecture. So, talking about like microservice design and how, how to optimize that for Kubernetes. The day after, uh, Bikram and Sachin, two DigitalOcean employees, so is Sarab, um, will be doing day two operations in Kubernetes. So Bikram has put together some incredible tutorials about, well, now I've set up a Kubernetes cluster, now what do I do? Um, with with like some great practical things you can do for your day two operations. And then on 
September 28th, uh, Billy Cleek and Ben Gadboy uh, from DigitalOcean, they work on our DOKS product. They are giving a talk called Improving the Kubernetes Experience, Eliminating Toil and Tribal Knowledge. Uh, we've added the links in the chat so you can register in advance for those talks. And if you Thanks. can't attend, you can watch them later, just like uh, this recording. Yeah, back to back three days of Kubernetes <laughs> tech talks. And then the week it's after that is KubeCon, I think. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That makes that makes more sense while we're doing it. Then, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I see. You can watch them live or you can grab them on YouTube afterwards. Um, Absolutely. All our tech talks are published there uh, and on the community website as well. I'll definitely and be so... listening in on the tribal knowledge one. I absolutely hate, hate that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. I think with that, that's everything for this week. Well, uh, Matt and I were like, let's do a short version of. We've ended up putting like an chats. hour and 17 minutes. Maybe 45 minutes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't do very well at that, but that's all right. Oh. <laughs> I had a really good time. Caleb, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you co host and hear about all of your interesting projects. Um, so I'll be looking into some of those. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I think with that, we'll say goodbye, everyone. Uh, and we'll see you same time next week, uh, hopefully with more more of us here. And we can do a <laughs> slightly fuller show. We need it for timing. <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs>